National conversation about race in the workplace has trickled its way into newsrooms and the Twitter sphere. We've seen editors and top publications resign. Journalists like Lee Fong publicly shamed. And all of this has led journalist Matt Taibbi to write that the American press is destroying itself. He notes that the process didn't start now and can find its roots in the coverage of the 2016 campaign. And Matt joins us via Skype for more. Matt, great to see you. Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you both. Yes, hi. This piece sparked a lot of conversation. <laughs> so just lay out the, the case that you were making for people who haven't read it yet. You know, I think what, uh, what we're looking at with this is just a series of incidents where you have people who work in the media who are afraid to report certain things or to express certain opinions on social media because they're afraid of their colleagues. And this is a long developing situation that, as I point out in the article, began, I think, in 2016 when people were they found themselves afraid to say certain things about the Hillary Clinton campaign because they were afraid of being perceived as anti or uh, as pro Trump uh, mm -hmm. or as helping Trump by reporting you know negative things about her campaign, and you know it's progressed through a series of moral manias. You, you both know with the Russia story, there was a, lot, a great deal of ostracization that went on with people who expressed alternative views. And now with this story, we've seen, you know, a, a dram dramatic escalation of it where we've had a series of ep episodes, including, you know, the, the incident involving Lee Fong at The Intercept, where the, the, essentially the problem is if you say a certain thing and, an, and an, an employee accuses you of racism, either your career is over or your reputation is ruined. And right. you, what ends up happening is people just sort of shrink back from wherever they perceive the boundaries are and don't say anything. And and that's not a healthy climate for journalism. No, it is. And one of the things I actually loved most about your piece, Matt, which I actually covered in my radar yesterday, was that self-policing um, is fine in this case, but as in the cases in which it's politically and morally acceptable to be wrong on, like Russiagate or many of these other areas, there's no self-policing whatsoever in the media. It's only in, the, in this case where if you express you know, any contrary idea to the prevailing narrative on Black Lives Matter or even, I mean, even coming from a journalist like Lee Fong, that that is a case where you're allowed to self-police within the media. Yeah, and again, as I point out in the piece, the the uprisings within the, the newsrooms are not geared toward people who make mistakes or who, who do things that traditionally would give the, new, the press a bad reputation. You bring up Russiagate, there were so many instances where editors greenlit articles that should not have been run because they were not properly vetted. Um, they turned out to be factually erroneous. Uh, and, you know, it's not just one organization or here and there. It's really pretty much all of them did that, whether we're talking about BuzzFeed with the, the Steele dossier or the New York Times when they ran that article saying that the Trump campaign had repeated contacts with Russian intelligence, a, an article that was later repudiated, but it still remains up on this uh, on their site without an editor's note. Um, you know, that that is OK to do. And, and nobody in the staff seems to have a problem with those kinds of factual errors. It's when you it's when you disagree with with certain uh, theoretical ideas that you that the colleagues get upset. And that's what I really worry about because it bleeds into the factual coverage, right? So right. if if you if you um, if you don't fully support the protests or if you have an indifferent view of the of the, of the protests, you may be more inclined to focus on things like the rooting and, and the looting and rioting. Um, but largely, that's not the case. And so what, what happens as a whole is that is that in many organizations, they downplay that aspect of the story because they were afraid of, of writing about it. Uh -huh. So, Matt, um, I think fair to say Sagar and I are both, you know, more sympathetic to your point of view. But I want to represent some of the critique that has come in. Nathan sure. Robinson, in particular, at Current Affairs, wrote a lengthy piece kind of going through point by point. And so I wanted to ask you about a couple of the points that he raised. One of his overarching concerns was the use of the term left um, as sort of a broad term. He felt that that was overly broad, that while there is this instinct in some corners of the Democratic Party or the media or the left, that it didn't exist writ large throughout the entirety of the left. What's your view of that? I'm using an umbrella term to describe a, a style of thought that I think is primarily emanating from the acad academia, but has come into the media of late, where it's 
Um, it's it's bullying in tone. It's accusatory. It uses shaming tactics, um, and it it doesn't particularly believe in civil liberties. It's it's very illiberal in, in its yeah. conception of the world. It it does you know you hear quite a, a lot uh, from people who have subscribed to this movement that traditional notions of fairness and balance don't work. So we have to try something else, right? So. Um, what I'm describing, I, I think, really is more the left than traditional liberal, than what, what you might call liberalism or the you know centrist liberals. I do think that one example, in, in a couple of examples, we've seen the Democratic Party, which is, I think, distinct from the left. They've adopted like the language of intersectionality when they felt it suits them, like uh, with Bernie Sanders in 2016. You know, they, they started calling him a sexist and racist and saying that he was an old white cis male who was out of touch with identity politics. You, you will see that. But I think that language and that tactic uh, comes more from what we would call the left than it does from, say, the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And the specific, and so people who didn't follow uh, what happened with Lee Fong at The Intercept, which has kind of been the flashpoint for your piece, also for uh, Jonathan Chait, wrote a piece sort of in a similar vein, which is interesting because he's kind of like a neoliberal. I don't agree with him on that many things, right. but I thought he wrote a decent piece here. Um, so Lee shared an, an interview from an African-American who was part of the protest who basically said, you know, why are we only concerned when black lives are taken by white people? Where's the concern? I want to see the concern also when black lives are taken by black people. And this was upsetting and controversial to some people because it is a trope to always turn around and say, oh, well, what about black on black crime? And so Lee shared this interview not his words that, you know, from this protester. And uh, another colleague at The Intercept essentially called him out on Twitter, and this is things sort of devolved from there. So the pushback from Nathan yeah, Robinson, you, you, go ahead. Cru crucially used the word racist. Yes. yes, important point. So and and so the criticism from Nathan Robinson was, look, Lee ultimately realized that he'd been ins insensitive in some of his remarks. He apologized of his own free will. He still has his job. So no one was deplatformed. No one was canceled. No one lost their job. What's the big deal? What's your response to that? Well, first of all, Lee's job was in trouble. It's been formally made clear to him that his continued employment at the, at the Intercept is going to be dependent upon his ability to avoid upsetting colleagues on, uh, in, in his social media comments. Uh, and it, also, I mean, the, the process of, of being denounced as a racist and have 30,000 people like it, uh, including many of your colleagues, many of the people that you work with, um, and, uh, you know, and, and people, and prominent people from other news organizations, just piling on and using this, this incredibly, uh, destructive term that is basically not survivable. I mean, if you're labeled a racist in, in this corner of the media, you, you really can't work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if, if he were to lose his job at, at, at the, uh, as a result of that, it, there, where is he going to go? Fox after that? I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's difficult. And, and it's, it's it's it, it personally devastating to go through this. I mean, yes. uh, yeah. there's there's nothing nothing like this, and and it's also unanswerable. You know, I mean, I think that's right. that's one of the things that's very difficult about all this. So uh, it, it's the, the again the, what I what is really really difficult about this is that when a call, when somebody does something that you d dislike, um, and they call you, uh, you know, they use one of these terms in, in response. There's there's no bouncing back from it. The, the game's already up at that point, reputationally, and that's what what people will do. Was just they just won't go near it. They, they, nobody's going to want to be Lee Fong, you know, going right. forward. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's. I would love to see Nathan Robinson get denounced, and we'll see how whether he thinks it's such a big deal. But Matt, one of the things right. I also loved about his little response here is he writes something a quote which might be true empirically, but right. And so he basically he basically is like admitting that there was an empirical. I mean, it is empirically proven that riots and looting do uh, move against public opinion. Something that Lee had pointed out, and David Shore, who is another person that you chronicled but basically discounting empirical evidence. I mean, that is something that I think is just, I mean, it, it's just an anti-intellectual project at that point. Well, right, and, and again, one, a lot of the arguments, the, the problem that I have with all of this is that 
in all of these instances, what we're talking about is people who just don't want to see something that's actually happening because it contradicts what their political with their political views. So, you know, in the case of that that social scientist David Shore, who who gets fired because he retweets a uh, a study by an African American social scientist, by the way, who had done a study suggesting that nonviolent protest is more efficacious than than violent protest. Uh, you know, it's it, the the problem isn't that uh, it isn't that those views are problematic. Uh, it's that y- you shouldn't be fired for for publishing legitimate research, no matter what the content of it is. Right. Um, and that's and that's the the in in Robinson's critique, which which I thought was crazy. The first thing he says is he says I I, I concede the empirical truth of of that study, uh, but I don't think it's a very good study. Uh, and he doesn't seem to be terribly ups- I mean, even though he says, I don't think he should have been fired for it. He, he, like, that's the entire point of the episode. Why are we, why are we discussing it otherwise? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. so yeah. And, and, what, and this gets to the Lee episode as well. Like Lee public, he, he runs an interview that some people don't like because it has a message they don't like, but it actually happened. The guy's real. I talked to him, you know, like he, mm-hmm. uh, you, you can't, what are you going to do? Not run it. I mean, yeah, you know, that's, that's not what we do. Well, and I also wanted to get your view on um, what happened with Tom Kahn, which we covered here extensively on this show. So he publishes this op-ed, I think it was called, like, Send in the Military, after President Trump's Rose Garden speech, where he threatens to invoke the Insurrection Act and send active duty military into American cities to quell riots. Um, So I had some issues with Cotton's op-ed in terms of, you know, I thought it was sort of there were some propagandistic elements that shaded the truth that weren't totally up front. But I also acknowledge his view is one that was held by the president of the United States and was held by not some not insignificant portion of the American public. The fallout from that obviously ends in the op-ed page editor, James Bennett, ultimately resigning. Now, part of, and this is one thing that Nathan raised that I, that I thought was legitimate, part of why he resigned is because he admitted he hadn't read this op-ed before it was even published, which seems like, you know, this is your job. You should have taken a look at this thing before it hit the pages um, of the paper. And also, I thought the New York Times response was fairly abhorrent, and they basically tried to throw this one relatively (laughs) young staffer under the bus. So I actually, I guess for different reasons, I am comfortable with some heads rolling on the handling and treatment of that op-ed, while I think that the decision to run it was probably the right call, ultimately. Yeah, I, I... People took a lot of my piece to be in defense of the Cotton editorial. That wasn't the case at all. The thing that I really had trouble with in in that episode was the fact that he resigned uh, basically because he he was getting a message that if your decision to run this editorial put black lives in danger, put the, the lives of black staff in danger, which is an unanswerable charge. I mean, there's 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 nothing you can say in response to that that it, that is going to be satisfactory, and I, I think absent that, I, 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 traditionally editors would have said would have said, okay, fine, taken under under consideration. You know, we'll run a rebuttal editorial. What else do you want to do about it? But in that environment, it was that charge that really sealed the fate of this editor. And again, it's the same thing over and over again in all these episodes. Somebody somebody says this is racist, therefore that person has to be fired. And then in the David Shore episode in with Lee, he's racist. He has to go to HR to save his job and he put, craft a public apology. Here it's, uh, you know, you put black, the lives of black staff in danger and you got to go. And it's this mechanism that's being repeated over and over again. And I it's a third rail topic. It's not comfortable, but that I, it's a style of thought that is, I think, really dangerous. Yeah, and I want to end on this note, Matt. Uh, tell everybody your credentials on um, writing about police brutality, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people might have forgotten in this episode. Yeah, I spent five years of my life on this topic. I wrote two books that were about inequities in the criminal justice system. I wrote a book called The Divide that is uh, Spent, I spent two years on that, basically comparing how uh, rich Wall Street defenders were treated as compared to poor black defendants. Mm. And then I wrote a book called I Can't Breathe, which is the, the Eric Garner story, which obviously has a lot of 
uh, pertinence to the George Floyd incident. The two the two cases were very similar. Um, so I, this is a deeply, profoundly, you know, important issue to me personally. And um, I'm not, uh, you know, like a Blue Lives Matter type of person by any stretch of the imagination. It This is more, I, I'm worried about something that I think doesn't have a whole lot to do with race at all. This has to do with a new style of thought that has permeated newsrooms and really has been in, uh, consistent throughout all of these moral manias since Hillary's election, whether we're talking about Russia Gate, Ukraine Gate, whatever, if you step outside the line, you're, there are going to be consequences, and that can't be the atmosphere we want to work in. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that point is really important that this isn't about your like siding with a particular view or another view. It's that you have to have intellectual diversity and freedom of thought. Otherwise, you end up with situations like Russia Gate. You end up with, you know, an election of Donald Trump that, you know, you caught most of America off guard because no one was reporting those things that you're talking about that may have been negative to the Hillary Clinton campaign. The last question I have for you is sort of a philosophical one, because part of the argument that was made around Cotton's op-ed in particular is like, this is a view that shouldn't be allowed in mainstream thought. Like the idea, like this is a view that borders on fascism, calling in the military to quell protests, and this shouldn't even be allowed, legitimized, because then you give it power. There's some truth to that because we see how powerful it is, the way that the guardrails are put on mainstream media and the debates and the arguments that you're allowed to have and what you're not allowed to have. And it is actually very powerful in terms of shaping thought and what people have permission to think and question, et cetera. So how do you think about where to draw that line of like what is allowable, what is permissible within the public discourse? And are there certain things like certain views that are so abhorrent that you shouldn't allow them on your op-ed pages, you know, especially at an institution as sort of influential and prestigious as, as the New York Times? I think we, we can all agree that there is a line somewhere. And certainly what we're dealing with in this controversy is a wide disagreement over where that line is. I think this cotton piece, uh, which I disagree with, um, is nowhere near that line, right? So if you, a lot of people said to me, well, what if he had said we should be putting black people in internment camps? Well, and my answer was, well, call me when that happens because that's not what this is, you know? Or if, you know, if somebody had said, let's make pedophilia legal or, you know, I mean, of course, I think those those views are, are out of the pale, don't have a place in, in this newspaper. I think what we're dealing with here is two fundamentally different ways of looking at what the role of the newspaper is. The op-ed page I have always viewed as being a, a part of the news mission, because when you get up in the morning, people who have, you know, who are decision makers, who are policy makers, as well as everybody else, they want to know what are people thinking today, right? So when the, the member of Congress opens up his times in the morning, he wants to see what the parameters of, of debate are. These people are thinking this, these people are thinking that. What the Times is now saying is, you can't see what one side of the of, of the the aisle is thinking in our newspaper. We're not going to permit that. So you have to go to Fox News now to see that argument made. Um, and I, I don't think that's helpful. I don't think that's it, it, what it what it really accomplishes is it makes your puts your readers in the dark about what a huge segment of the country is thinking. And I don't I, that defe that defeats the mission to me of the news in general. Yeah, no, well you're, said. You're right. Everybody should check out your piece. They should read Nathan's piece as well, but um, I think really excellently put. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. Sager, take care. See you, man. Coming up, new Iowa poll. Not looking so good for President Trump. We're going to break it down when rising returns. <laughs>